conceptual perspectives people talk Real about talk, it, it throwing shots. all of the elements. <laughs> Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody's having an unbelievable uh, start to your week. Hope that you enjoyed your family over the weekend and whatever you did, whether you celebrate Christmas or you didn't. I hope that you had time to really love on people. Look, don't go into this new year carrying hate, carrying grudges, carrying anything that's going to mess with your spirit, that's going to destroy your energy, your vibration, your frequency. Whatever you do, make sure that you are on the highest frequency possible, that you are operating from a place of love, a place of gratitude and thankfulness, a place of high expectation and anticipation. Um, life is going to throw curves at you. Life is going to uh, deal rough hands sometimes. That's a par for the course. What we have to learn how to do is manage that. It's just a little bit for me to you. Here is our fourth installment on our reading from Born in Captivity, Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery. Um, and what I, what I want to do is in this reading is go back to where we left off. We left off with understanding racial trauma, understanding why we collectively uh, tend to make certain decisions and choices that don't uh, work to our benefit, that don't serve our interests, that don't... Uh, progress us towards the things we say we did, we desire, like empowerment and generational wealth and so much more. Um, and when I left off, I left off talking about the tendency to study black behavior collectively under the path of, the pathology model, where we're looking for pathological behavior. We're studying the pathology of certain uh, fallouts of what I believe to be trauma in my studies. But what we do is when we're looking at it from a pathological perspective, where we're studying the courses, the components, the consequences uh, of the development of a negative uh, reality. Uh, in medicine, pathology is a study of diseases and psychology is a study of mental illness. But in, in the collective behavior of blacks, it's the study of antisocial behavior, meaning behavior that does not pro pro progress us in a positive way. And so we talked about the pathology model. model. The problem with the pathology model, psychopathology, and understanding things in that domain demands a deficit. It focuses on the deficit. It focuses on what's missing. It focuses on what's wrong. It focuses on that. But what I like about the trauma model, and we're about to learn a little bit about that in this real quick and brief reading, is the trauma model does not demand a deficit and it focuses on causality. When you focus on causality, you go to the core of the symptom. Instead of looking at the symptom, instead of judging the symptom, instead of uh, lamenting on the symptom, you simply go to the cause. You address the cause. When you address the cause, you change the outcome. And that's real simplified, and uh, I know, but and, but but it's, we have to start somewhere. And so um, 
this book is a combination of years and years of research and development a number of uh development of a number of different theories uh which i mentioned in the previous reading if you want to learn more about those collective cognitive dominant bias and so many more that i developed to explain some of the behaviors uh go back to the previous installment this is installment number four we're going to read uh, a sub uh subtopic within the same chapter entitled understanding the trauma model trauma in many instances is a single or a single or repetitive event that overwhelms the nervous system due to a real or perceived threat when there is a real or perceived threat we as humans organize our functioning for the purpose of responding to the threat for those who may be wondering why a perceived threat could cause damage and compromise the brain, it is because our nervous system does not do a very good job of distinguishing between a real or perceived threat. Additionally, what is considered dangerous is not universal among humans. Experience and ability to reason can play an immense role in determining how a person perceives a situation. For instance, in the same home, a parent raising a fist at a three-year-old will likely incite fear which can lead to a traumatic experience. Conversely, the same parent raising a fist to an eight-year-old sibling will be responded to differently because of the older sibling's experience and ability to process what is happening allows them to ascertain that the parent is simply gesturing in a playful manner. The fact that perception frames the idea of what is dangerous means past experiences play an important role in determining how people interpret a situation to determine if a situation or experience is dangerous. For instance, a man who, as a boy, was traumatized by domestic violence was, that was characterized by loud shouting matches between his parents may tend to become anxious and agitated when amongst a room full of excited and elated football fans. Although the situation is not hostile, the association of loud raised voices and excitement with violence will <clears throat> this excuse me, this man experiences a philosoph a physio excuse me. <laughs> this man experiences a physiological effect. This same man, when amid a boisterous crowd, now holds his seven year old son's hands real anxiously. Now the boy becomes nervous in crowds. The simple example this simple example not only illustrates the role of perception in determining what is dangerous, but it also illustrates how we can literally learn what is dangerous through relationships in addition to the direct experience. How does trauma impact human behavior? When there is an assumed threat, living organisms, living organisms will respond one of four basic ways. Emotional withdrawal, physical distance by freezing and uh, physical uh, distance by freezing and aggression. In instances by freezing and aggression. In instances where large groups of people are experiencing danger simultaneously, the entire range of responses can be observed. These variations in threat response can be observed during any type of perceived threat among groups. There is no response to threats that can be considered universally better than the rest. The best response is determined by the situation and its underlying influence. The most optimal functioning is experienced when humans are able to use any of these mechanisms in the appropriate situation at the appropriate time. Trauma occurs in two primary phases. The first phase is the arousal phase, which is where our nervous system revs up for the purpose of efficaciously responding to the threat. During the initial phase, our sense of time will become narrow, losing our sense of the future, being completely focused on the moment at hand. Next, we lose our capacity for empathy, becoming more self-consumed, transitioning to primitive responses such as fight or flight. Additionally, we rapidly scan our immediate uh, area and environment to detect any additional threats. We will also naturally gravitate to people who are like us while becoming increasingly suspicious of those we consider to be different. People who are highly functional will be able to determine the most appropriate course of action despite being emotionally aroused by a traumatic experience. Create, create, creatively creating or inventing new responses to the perceived threat and they have the capacity to immediately self-correct when the initial response is not proving efficacious. The recovery phase of trauma is the period in which we begin to develop coping mechanisms to assist us in processing the experience. 
The most functional individuals will learn from their traumatic experience developing an elevated sense of confidence and preparedness for future situations that are similar in nature. They will be able to function at a higher level than they did prior to the trauma. Poor recovery from traumatic experience can manifest itself in several different ways. However, the most common response is constant hypervigilance, a response in which the person lives their life as if their traumatic event is perpetual. The person who responds to trauma in a non-efficacious manner will remain sensitive and vigilant, constantly looking out for dangers. They will generally have exaggerated responses to minimal or non-existent threats that will they will go to great lengths to avoid encounters with people or situations that have the capacity to trigger re-experiencing the threat, or they will become numb to real and perceived threats, failing to accurately perceive dangers. One way that some individuals are able to remain numb is that they continue to create dangerous situations that serve to further desensitize them to the presence of danger. That's why you see some people who have been through uh, trauma doing things that don't make sense uh, that seem obvious that they shouldn't be doing it. Uh, it's dangerous. Some people who survive rape become highly promiscuous. Um, some people who survive rape become completely withdrawn. Just the touch of a human touching them sends them into a panic. And all of these things are responses and you can't predict how a person will respond. Uh, generally, the level at which an individual can recover from trauma will uh, be determined uh, will determine how well they will be able to function in the future. The way we respond to trauma will have a massive impact on how well we're able to deal with future stresses in life. One of the most effective indicators of the likelihood of a person successfully recovering from trauma is the presence of highly qualified of high quality relationships that help them develop coping skills that will be vital to their recovery and future responses to threats real or perceived. And, you know, it goes on and on and we'll get into some more of that. Basically what I'm trying to get people to understand is that trauma changes how we process everyday things. Trauma is experienced in multiple ways. It's experienced as a, psychological and emotional experience, but it's also experienced physiologically. Matter of fact, the most emphatic experience of a traumatic event, no matter how psychological, will be physiological. Um, for instance, there were people who watched the 9-11 uh, catastrophe with the Twin Towers in, from another country, mm -hmm. and there are therapists reporting that they're still treating people for the trauma they experienced. Uh, there are people that were in the building who seem to be functioning quite well, who have never had one day with the, with the therapist. Uh, your, your trauma threshold, which is something I'm going to explain in the next reading, your trauma threshold will have a lot to do with how traumatic events experience you. People who are constantly under state of stress, People who are constantly under, under, the, under the threat of harm in any way. People who have experienced complex trauma, which is stacked trauma. All you need is one traumatic experience to be traumatized. The average black person has experienced what we call complex trauma, which is stacked trauma. It means that they've experienced more than one traumatic event and probably haven't been treated and helped with any of them. Well, the more you go through those type of experiences, the more you deal with stress. That's why we have to focus on what is known as childhood adverse, uh, adverse childhood experiences, which are ACEs. These adverse childhood experiences are traumatic experiences and events that happen in the life of a child, but they have long reaching consequences well into adulthood that impact emotional health, psychological health, and even physiological health. Uh, a child with four ACEs, Every adverse experience that, that is readily identified as something that is an adverse experience for a child counts as one ace. A child with four aces. Let me give you an example of some, some childhood, uh, adverse childhood experiences. Parents divorcing. Parent uh, de dependent upon a chemical substance, suffering from an addiction. Parent verbally, emotionally, psychologically violent. Uh, are abusive. 
um, parent becoming incarcerated, losing a parent to death, and um, neglect, and verbal abuse, and a number of other things. But each one of those counts as one. Think about how many you went through as a child. Now, just four aces, a child who experienced four aces is 12 times more likely to attempt suicide, four times more likely to develop ischemic heart disease, four and a half times more likely to develop diabetes, type 2 diabetes. And I can go on down the line of little pathological diseases that they're likely, uh, including cancer, including autoimmune diseases like lupus. This is what we have to look at. Nothing just simply happens. We're talking about genes. When we talk about cancer, we're talking about not simply something just popping out of nowhere. It's the upregulation of disease genes. Everybody has them. Everybody has disease genes. Cancer genes are there. But what happens is there are what we call healthy genes. These health genes are literally designed to keep negative and destructive genes at bay, downregulated. So genes, in order to be functional, have to be upregulated or what we call turned on. When you turn on a gene, the gene functions. Well, in order for, for each different type of cancer, there has to be a certain number and type of cancer genes upregulated and turned on. Guess what the number one influence is? Carcinogens play a role, but they're not number one. Family history play a role, but they're not even close to being number one. You know what number one is? Environment. Not what you're breathing in and all of that type of environment. Stress, abuse, neglect, violence, all of these things that heighten your senses and put you in a curtain state of stress. You know why? When you go into those stress modes, your body is sensing and, 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 and creating a very primitive response to threats. Even when they're perceived threats, the body, the brain only, the, the, the limbic, system, limbic system or the reptilian brain can only respond in one way and it creates the fight or flight stress response. Now, the problem with that is if you really got to run, it's a great thing because it's going to give you more alertness, more, more energy, more oxygen to your extremities. Uh, it's going to prepare you to fight or run. Here's the problem. 99.9% .9 of our stressors aren't something we can actually fight. It's the boss at work that rules with an iron fist. It's the tumultuous relationship that we're in where everything's an argument. It's um, the light bill being due and uh, the, the mortgage being two months and three months behind and, and all of the things that are a part of the poverty experience. Uh, urban hassle, just the gunshots firing in the middle of the night. If you grew up in the hood, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I mean, it's just so many things that are a part of this, right? Okay, so you don't get to escape that. That's constantly going. Well, now you develop this thing called chronic stress. And now that, what does that mean? That means the body is in a constant state of trying to produce adrenaline and cortisol and keep your body. The problem is when you produce adrenaline and cortisol, what happens? The heart rate goes up. Arteries constrict. The prefrontal cortex shuts down. That's a big problem. Why? That's your decision making. That's your executive functioning part of the brain. That's where you get reason, rationale. That's where you uh, have impulse control to keep you from doing things impulsively and stupidly that you regret, regret later. All of that stuff is in your prefrontal cortex. And yet it shuts down in order to serve the fight or flight. Why? Because the prefrontal cortex is so massive and has so much function going on that it requires a large amount of oxygen. 30% of your oxygen flow during your conscious state is going to serve this. So in order for me to be able to fight or flight, I don't need to make rational decisions. I need to throw hands or I need to pick them up and put them down. Well, then that shuts down. Problem is now I can't make a decision. That's why they said, well, why didn't he just lay down? Why didn't he just be still? When you feel the threat, 
all reason and rationale go out of the window. This is why people need to understand this. This is why we need to learn how to deal with our children. This is why we need to learn how to deal with our mates. This is how we need to really sit back and understand the, 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 the significance of what trauma can do at different levels. So when a person is triggered, you understand what's going on. A person who's literally going through a traumatic memory or what's also known as implicit memory is they aren't remembering the event, they're reliving it. It's real. So imagine a person that's in real time, all of a sudden being triggered, and now nothing is making sense to you because what they're doing doesn't make sense. And they'll do this over and over again and they won't know why they did it because they don't understand how trauma has impacted them. I've been talking about this, I've been teaching about this, I've been writing about this. Um, this is, that's why it's so important to have these mental health programs. That's why it's so important to properly develop our children. When we properly develop our children, some of the things that are traumatizing them after they go out into the world wouldn't because they would be prepared for it. They would understand it. They wouldn't know how to deal with it. That's a problem. And that's something that we need to deal with. I went way over. I didn't mean to do this, but I really want people to understand that when I'm talking about these things, I rarely get into the technical, technical discussion. I rarely get into the deep detail, but I'm going to start doing that because people need to understand what's going on has causality. We rarely look at causality. Even in the medical field, there's no problem in causality because if I find causality and I address causality, I heal the issue. There's no profit in healing. The profit is in subduing the symptom. So what do I do? I address symptoms. I give you medication that address symptoms and create other symptoms. But it doesn't deal. And the true meaning is that everyone is healable. Everyone can be healed. The thing is, are we really working towards healing? And what I can tell you is the vast majority of us are not. And so you get these collective, collective behaviors that are direct descendants of our traumatic experiences. And we don't deal with them because we have been taught that the way we, we behave is simply a part of our culture. We don't look at it as a part of the pathology of what we've been through. We don't look at it as the results of our trauma. We look at it as that's just how we are. No, we are a people who have had a unique and collective universal experience in varying ways over time. And that experience has not been conducive to strengthening us, to making us whole, to making us healthy, to making us positive pro-social individuals. It has drained us. It has made us untrusting. It has made us hypervigilant. It has brought a very high level of selfishness out of us, which is actually a part of the trauma response. And people don't get that. It's, it, it, some of it is cultural influence because everybody is being taught and told to think about themselves. But uh, when, you, when, when, when you're dealing with a threat and you're dealing with trauma, there's a natural response in your hypervigilance, in your uh, desire to protect yourself. You become more self-consumed. You become more self-focused. You become more self-centered because you don't trust anything. And, 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 and here's the other problem with that. You tend to gravitate towards people like yourself. Well, initially that's race, but then it becomes you gravitate towards other traumatized people. We have to deal with this. On that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. If, uh, if you want to get uh, a copy of Born in Captivity, Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery, which is my 19th book, uh, we just released, re-released uh, my 25th book, uh, The War on Black Wealth. Uh, so I'm really excited about finally getting that the way I want it to, to be. And I'm already on book number 26 working on that. But this is Born in Captivity, Psychopathology is a Legacy. If you want to get it, the link is in there. If you want to get my Mega, Mega Power book bundle, which is my seven most requested titles from my catalog, that link's going to be in there as well. If you want to support the work we're doing in research, in program development, uh, in direct engagement, in this issue, uh, so click the link on the, in the description box to support the work we're doing. Um, and you can always designate how you want your, your, your donation to go. If it says Black Men Lead, just say uh, uh, in, in, in the uh, comments for uh, research. And it's going to be earmarked for research. 
And the thing is, we're so behind on the books as far as resourcing it outside of me. Literally, I'm funding everything. So if it, if it, it it's no big deal, just say what you want. But we definitely would love to have some support on this. Look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. I uh, hope that what I shared with you brought some enlightenment. Um, I, I want to really get your comments. I want to get your questions because I want to answer your questions. I want to address it. The way we're going to really truly grow in this and come out of this isn't by debating. It isn't going to be by begging. It's going to be by becoming aware of what's wrong and fixing it. Not asking someone else to do it. Not, not sitting up pointing the finger of blame. We know Who's responsible for what? Some of the stuff we've got culpability in. Other stuff, we know where it's coming from. We need to be aware and we need to be taking moves. The best way to stop something is to execute your power for change. This is what I'm in, uh, trying to incite you guys to do. On that note, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day. I'm out.